So hello everyone and welcome to today's webinar, which is part of World Cancer Day today. I'm delighted to be joined by a panel of experts who are taking part in a discussion about the changing priorities in cancer care and research. They'll be introducing themselves shortly, but thank you for taking the time out of your day to join us. For those of you that don't know me, I'm Hazel and I'm a course advisor for our new part-time online masters in transformative oncology. This course is designed with working professionals in mind and allows you to reposition yourself as a leader in transforming patient outcomes and cancer care without taking the time away from your busy and important work. As a course advisor, I'm here to help make sure that you have all the information you need to make an informed decision about studying one of our online courses. And I'm also here to help guide you through the application process should you decide to apply to us. I work closely with Dr Suzanne Johnson, the course director for our Transformative Oncology course, who will be facilitating today's panel discussion. I'm sure that everyone watching today will agree that the past two years have caused unprecedented challenges for not just oncologists, but healthcare professionals as a whole. Our panel today will be sharing not only those experiences of those challenges, but how they're looking to overcome them and their hopes for the future of cancer care and research. I'll shortly be handing over to them, but before I do, I just want to give a couple of bits of housekeeping information. Whether you're joining us today here on Zoom or watching our live streams on LinkedIn and YouTube, I just want to say thank you for taking the time out of your days to join us as well. We have the chat functions available and we encourage audience participation. So please say hi and let us know where you're joining us from today. And during the discussion, please share your thoughts and any questions that you have about some of the topics that we're discussing. We'll be sharing as many of these as possible at the end of today's webinar. I feel like I've already talked for far too long. So without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Dr. Suzanne Johnson to introduce herself and the panel. Thanks, Havel. So hello everybody, um, I'm delighted to be joined here by some of my favourite colleagues here in Manchester, albeit virtually, um, and I'll ask them to come in and introduce themselves in just a moment. Um, but we are here on World Cancer Day, as Hazel said, to discuss the new programme, Transformative Oncology, which is an online master's programme, um, and we will be welcoming new students in this September, so it's an exciting year for us. Um, but it's also a really poignant time to reflect a little on the landscape of cancer in terms of research, education, and also really work, work, workforce training um, as the world continues to be affected by COVID-19. Um, so the programme is designed to reflect the change in needs of healthcare and also appeal to the, to the global audience. So we'll be using real world examples and case studies but it's balanced with some of the insights of the innovative research and the therapeutic strategies that we use here in Manchester. So perhaps I can invite my uh, fellow colleagues to, to pop onto the screen with me and um, we'll start some introductions and perhaps we will go, maybe we'll go alphabetical. So let's go Bill, Al, Keith and then Marianne. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Suze. Uh, my name is Bilal al -Kafaf. I am a consultant esophagogastric cancer surgeon based at Salford Royal. Salford Royal is uh, one of the several hospitals based in Manchester, and it's a university teaching hospital. I'm also an honorary senior lecturer at the University of Manchester with the Division of Cancer Sciences. And finally, uh, with regards to the MSc course, I'm a deputy uh, director of the course. Thanks, Bilal. Keith? Um, so, lovely to see you today, Suze. Um, I'm Keith Brennan. I'm the Associate Dean for Internationalisation within the Faculty of Biology, Medicine and Health, which means that I get to do a lot of meeting and greeting of, of international partners of the faculty. I'm also a, a developmental biologist by training, and I'm very interested in how cells communicate with each other and how those communications go wrong at the very start of cancer. Uh, and particularly within um, breast cancer and how the, that miscommunication will lead to the, the formation of a breast cancer in the first place. Um, with regards to the programme, I think I've just been the quiet champion at the back, hopefully to support you to do the fantastic work that you've done to get this programme up and going. Thanks, Keith. And Marianne, please. Hey everyone, my name is Marianne Aznar. I'm a senior lecturer in uh, adaptive radiotherapy physics. 
I'm also a trained medical physicist, which means my expertise and my clinical background is in treating cancer using radiation. My own research interests now that I've moved into academia are the late side effects of cancer treatment. And I think it's a very exciting and very under-researched area. In the transformative oncology program, I'm going to lead the module on radiotherapy. Radiotherapy is probably one of the less well-known cancer treatments, even though it's, it's given to many, many patients. It's, it's a little bit unknown by, by the, the, the public and the researchers. So I'm hoping to communicate my passion for this field and how we can improve patient outcomes using radiation. Fantastic, thank you. Well, welcome and thank you all three for, for giving up your time for a chat today. Um, so really we can, can reflect on this post-COVID um, delays across the whole cancer pathway. Um, so maybe you can ask for some reflections on why now is a really good time to start learning about oncology. Um, who would like to pop in first? Um, I'm happy to start. Um, right. I think, at the same, yes, we've, we've had immense challenges over the last couple of years, haven't we? Um, but never have we had the same opportunity to address some of these challenges, not just, not that have just come about from COVID, but that have chronically affected uh, patients in the region, uh, nationally and internationally. Uh, what we've certainly seen is some of the approaches to dealing with the challenges that are being posed by COVID have also helped us deal with some of the challenges that were here long before COVID. So I think now is a good time, as you've said, to reflect on how COVID uh, and the pandemic has affected pathways uh, from all the way from diagnosing cancer through to how we stage cancer, how we prepare patients for treatment, and then importantly, how we improve outcomes in the longer term. Uh, and, and I think there's no better time than now to start doing that. Absolutely. And I guess from your point of view, um, often overlooked as what, when describing cancer treatment, surgical oncology is often one of the first um, interventions for, for a patient presenting, particularly if they're presenting with later stage disease. So it's a growing research field in its own right. Absolutely. There's lots uh, from the research perspective that um, we're trying to incorporate. Uh, sur surgery has uh, by some been seen as a field which has often lagged behind in terms of research and research methodology. Um, we certainly have our expertise here uh, in the Northwest and in Manchester to try and change that, to try and improve the quality of research and research trials. Um, one of my personal interests is improving outcomes and how we report outcomes in surgical trials, how we improve the quality of what we, um, what we do when we undertake surgical trials. Uh, myself, my team, my colleagues, my network uh, in, in the Northwest and around the country that I work, who I work very closely with are very keen to, to improve on, on um, what has historically been undertaken uh, in the past. So, I agree with you entirely there. And what's great about this program is that we're bringing, we're really sort of bringing together both the clinical and the scientific viewpoints and strategies and also the research that underpins all of that. Um, so Bilal, of course, will be the unit lead for, for the unit on the branches of oncology. And you have a dedicated area of surgical oncology just for you to, to show your real talent. So that's great. Um, yeah. And of course, cancer is a disease which affects people um, regardless of their geography. So it's really a, a global challenge, Keith. Oh, I was going to take it, take it that in a different way. All right. Okay. Oh, can, I, can I answer a different question? The first question first, what's, what's, what's really interesting and what I've seen happen. So as I've mentioned, I'm, a, I'm, I'm trained as a developmental biologist. So I'm interested, or I certainly was initially interested in how you make different types of cell, how you make the differences between those cells, how you place them in the body. So thinking about that, how you develop from the fertilized egg through to the final adult. Um, what that's shown us and what that's taught us is how you make tissues. How do you make a piece of skin? How do you make a bit of, of colon and so on and so forth? And it's very clear that the cells in the body have to talk to one another. They have to really, there's a lot of conversation going on between the cells the whole of the time um, to, to, um, to actually make all those different types of cell. And what we've begun to appreciate, or I think now we very much do appreciate, 
is that um, that communication breaks down. Um, so if you think about a piece of skin, um, it's turning over all the time. I always cringe at the idea that supposedly 95% of house stuff is dead skin. Um, I'm not sure that's right, but that's what I hear. Um, but it's turning over all the time. That's running the developmental program all the time to make that new skin. Um, and what's happening in the very early stages of the cancer is that communication is breaking down and it's going wrong. And instead of turning over the tissue, you're, you're building up too much and you're starting to get that start of that cancer. Now, how this actually impacts on oncology is because we know those communications, because we know those signals, we can start to make treatments. And actually one of the things that I can see in the very much the targeted um, uh, therapies, the, the targeted uh, chemotherapies that are coming through, there's a lot of them that are based out of our understanding of how the embryo develops into an adult. How do you make a tissue? Um, there's lots of new therapies coming through which are very specific, they are very targeted, they are aimed to treat very particular things. Um, and it's really interesting watching all of those come into the market and actually now uh, start to work, work out how best to use those and how best to use them um, to get the best treatment for individuals. And I think that's the, the important thing that I'm seeing come through is that actually cancer treatments start to become the treatment of an individual, not a group of people that all look kind of similar. It's actually this person I need to treat this way. That person might look quite similar, but there's some differences here and I need to treat them that way. So that was, I, I, sorry, I was thinking about your answer to your first question. I maybe get to the global one when we get to the second question. Um, Absolutely. Yeah, that's where I was coming from. Can I answer your first question as well, Susan? Of course, my because one of the things that's interesting with radiotherapy is that, of course, we've been under a lot of pressure, and, and this is a field that has struggled with the pandemic, as, as many others. But there's been some unexpected silver linings from the pandemic as well. So one of the challenges with radiotherapy is that a patient comes for many treatments every day during several weeks. And of course, in a time of high contagion risk, this is an issue. So the pandemic has been an accelerator for a trend that has been going for many years and that actually has started at the Christie, or at least the Christie has been a, a strong proponent of it for many years, which is to condense those treatments and to give a higher dose of radiation in fewer treatments. And because of the pandemic, this idea has really been adopted worldwide and we've seen a real push for fewer shorter treatments delivered with very high precision using all the technology that we have. Another interesting effect, which we hadn't anticipated, is that in some patients, like for example, early stage lung cancer, um, radiotherapy or surgery are both very good treatments. But because of the pandemic, we've seen a lot of those patients that would have had surgery as an option preferentially referred to radiotherapy because of the, you know, the slightly less invasive procedure and, and again, a, a smaller risk in a time of high contagion. So all of these I'm expected are going to stick and they're going to be a great um, um, area of research and, and, uh, and development for, for you know, some very obvious benefit from the patient and also from a social economic point of view, which I think is a very you know, global way of thinking about it as well in countries that are struggling with a limited amount of resources, giving those shorter, more condensed treatment is a real strength to reach as many people as possible. And that's what's key here, isn't it, that we, Whatever we learn, whatever we develop in research, whatever we develop in the, in the classroom, in the lecture mm -hmm. theatre, it gets translated into clinical practice for the benefit of the patient. And that's what I'm really keen to uh, emphasise about the, this course in particular, that it covers not only the basic science, uh, genomics, the uh, cellular microenvironment, but it takes people through that entire pathway that entire journey from the very basic elements all the way through to how people are diagnosed how to reorganize services particularly post-covid or even pre-covid and go through the the local challenges so that people who participate in this in in, in the msc and the program are able to take um some lessons from one another and lessons from our experience 
because we're far from perfect within our region. You know, we were talking previously about um, the, the significant challenges that we have in, in our region, certainly in Manchester in the northwest of England. We have uh, historically suffered um, when it came to the survival of cancer patients. Our outcomes were historically some of the worst in, in uh, Western Europe. And there's lots and lots of work that, and lots of money that has been invested into trying to reverse that. So what we want to do is also capture some of that and some of that experience and expertise so that course participants can take those lessons and apply them locally uh, to their practice. Absolutely, and that's a really important point actually, because the way that we are structuring the programme is to enable that community of learning to be built. So despite the fact that we're not all here in Manchester together, we'll be using some of the flavors of Manchester to, to share our expertise, but also encouraging that reflective practice within the people on the, on the program and getting that communication between different cohorts of people around the globe. And by doing so, we'll all be able to learn different experiences and different um, lived experiences um, you know, from, across the, from across the cohort. So that's a real strength of, of the programme, actually. Fantastic. Um, so if we think about sort of hot topics and challenges, particularly maybe in your specific areas, um, what would you say are the, are the, are the main strands that are working in your area at the moment? Marianne. Can I start? So I think one of the, the really hot trends, and I think this is true for radiotherapy, but I'm sure Bilal will, will agree with me as, as well, it, it's personalization, is how can we make sure that the right treatment goes to the right patient? Uh, when should, you know, when, you, when you're using different treatment modalities, how do you combine them? Uh, when do you combine them? Another big area of research, and again, I think that has been that has been really under research and, and when Manchester has a real strength, is in how do we treat the vulnerable patient population? So patients that are not, you know, your young, fit, healthy, socioeconomically strong patients. So people who come with heart disease, people who come with arthritis, people who come with pulmonary diseases. How can we make sure that the treatments that we give them are, are you know, efficient against their cancer, but do not cause um, other health problems, seeing that they're already, you know, um, they already have a, a significant burden of comorbidities. And all of these, you know, they seem, they seem maybe simple, but they're extremely complex because everything is extremely individual. People have their own, you know, they, they take different drugs for different chronic health conditions. And when they come to their cancer treatment is how do we take all of this into account? the whole person, not just the cancer that they have as, as, as a limited uh, vision of that person. Absolutely, and this sort of research on comorbidity, it's a really big area of research actually in Manchester at the moment, um, and really important to, to take those considerations on board. Um, Keith? Uh, I, I'm thinking, um, which, which is where we do start to get to, you, you, where you were touching on with the global sort of point of view, but. It comes back to what Marianne's talking around as well. Um, treatment that you would give to someone of European descent is different to what you would give to somebody of African descent or, 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 or East Asian descent. Um, we have to appreciate these differences. And actually, we haven't done an awful lot in this space, or we've done as, not as much as we should have done. Um, and actually, I was going to think, I think one of the really exciting things is uh, for us is the, the work that we're initiating in Kenya and we're working with our Kenyan colleagues um, at, at the Kenyatta University uh, Teaching Referral and Research Hospital, um, starting to look at, um, actually, it's, it's the cancer that Bilal treats, esophageal cancer. However, the esophageal cancer that you see in Kenya is different to the one that Bilal will see most days of the week. It's a, it's a squamous cancer. It's not an adenocarcinoma, so it is a different cancer. And it needs to be treated differently. And one of the things that we're hoping to do through this work, and, and really very much led by our Kenyan colleagues, is start to actually fill in that absence, that lack of knowledge that we have in that space, um, to actually start to, 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 to understand squamous carcinoma of the esophagus but in Kenyan people in Kenya so that we can actually understand the disease in that situation. Um, 
we wait and see. We'll see what the what the what the what the research, the genomics uh, highlights. I'm sure it will feed into the into the into the treatments. Um, there's as we've been talking, there's a whole battery of different treatments that are available now. And it's going to be a question of of, of selecting the, the the best and the most appropriate. Um, but I can also see a benefit to this coming back and learning back in Manchester, because actually, um, you know, Marianne was talking about vulnerable populations or, or underrepresented populations. Um, we have to, if we reflect on, on what happens in, in Manchester and at the, at, the, at the Christie Hospital and the other hospitals around, actually there are certain patient groups that we don't engage with as well as we should do. And we could potentially from working with our Kenyan colleagues, learn information to bring back here by diverse, not potentially, I expect us to really, we will learn stuff and bring it, be able to bring it back and bring it back into practice here and influence what we do here, which I think will be fantastic. And that ability to learn globally is an amazing, amazing possibility. So that's what I'm, I'm looking forward to. Fantastic. You're absolutely right. And, you know, some of the key aspects of that, and we build again, we build this into the programme, is that understanding of taking the time to build relationships and um, reach out to communities and make sure that we're getting representative um, members of the, of the communities that we are seeking to serve and we are seeking to understand better so that we have, you know, better diversity within our clinical trials. We have better diversity within our samples and our models that we're using for our scientific investigations, etc. So, yeah, so the, we have um, a unit on the on the programme also around um, the patient pathway and understanding the importance of a multidisciplinary team and how, you know, cancer itself is complex. But the people involved in treating, diagnosing cancer, researching cancer, there are so many job roles and so many opportunities for people to get involved within that, that pathway. And we sort of cover all of those, that sort of more conceptual appreciation on the programme. So it's absolutely right. Um, so I suppose the question really then is, is for people on the call who might be thinking about applying for the programme, why Manchester? What, why, what is it about Manchester that makes us so, so strong in the area of oncology? So um, I'd like to just come in and just talk a little bit about surgical hot research topics yeah. as well, if that's OK with you. Absolutely. Um, so I think um, with surgery, uh, cancer surgery in particular for a lot of people is invasive. Um, it can have devastating outcomes and consequences, which is why people have traditionally tried to look towards other non-surgical treatments for, for certain cancers. But here we are, um, surgery is still the staple of many types of um, cancer treatments. Um, and it's not going anywhere anytime soon. When we look at cancer surgery and looking at the, cancer to uh, the research topics, what we have to come back to is that always that balance of risk and benefit with surgery. The risks are significant, with, particularly with solid organ tumour surgery, uh, brain uh, tumours, uh, GI tumours, because to get to these cancers to remove them, there's lots of trauma that needs to be caused. And when they are removed, then the side effects of that surgery can be devastating and can have a, an impact on quality of life. The benefits, of course, um, you know, we're, we're, we know removing primary cancer um, has a potential of potentially uh, of curing patients. So when we look at the hot topics, we're looking at how do we improve that balance to the favour of better outcomes and less uh, invasiveness of, of the surgery. That needs to, so the better outcomes involves improving the entire pathway right from the beginning. That means how do we prepare the patient for surgery? How do we optimize their fitness so that they have the physiological reserve to withstand the trauma of surgery so that they have a better outcome in the longer term? Marianne's talked about her research interests is about the long-term outcomes, living with cancer, li living post-treatment for cancer. And as surgery improves, and we become technically more advanced, um, then people are living longer, but consequently, they're often also living longer with some of the consequences of the treatment, consequences of surgery. And the focus has begun to shift away from short-term outcomes to the longer-term outcomes. What's the quality of life? 
what is the what are the nutritional impacts of uh, of surgical interventions and this is something that i and my colleagues are particularly interested in um, because of the way that manchester is organized and is um, and is built we have lots and lots of different hospitals within a very small uh, geographical area we have had to redesign our services to improve pathways for patients uh, one of the biggest things that has come out of our cancer experience is a group called Manche Greater Manchester Cancer, which aims to improve the flow for patients and improve outcomes, improve patient experience. Um, one of the focuses of Greater Manchester Cancer has been this focus on prehabilitation. How do you prepare patients for surgery so that they can withstand you know, the, 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 uh, the trauma of surgery. So that's a very interesting area that is showing some real benefits, real world benefits to patients that hopefully our participants can, can learn about. We can't also uh, talk about surgery without talking about the new technology that, that is already present and is, and is coming around the corner. Robotic surgery, uh, how we incorporate artificial intelligence with uh, operating, so that we can, again, be more precise in what we remove and how we remove it. So there's lots of technical, technological advancements that, again, people will be able to learn um, in, in, in this course. So for me, of course, I'm biased about surgery. I think that <laughs> surgical oncology is probably the most exciting area uh, to learn about. And I would encourage people to, to sign up if they're interested in that. Fantastic. Thank you. And, you know, talking about um, advances in, in uh, technology, I mean, over the last decade, there's been huge, huge um, strides forward, particularly around uh, single cell analysis, multi-omics technologies, etc. Um, but, you know, it's not all about biology, is it, Marianne? I'm sure you'd like to come in and comment a little bit about the physics side. Definitely. Well, I, I, I can take you through a very, you know, personal view of one man, why Manchester, and that's definitely going to incorporate the physics aspect. So I moved to Manchester four and a half years ago. It doesn't seem that long. And the reason why I decided to move in Manchester was first because of all the tech. From a radiotherapy perspective, we have access to the, to the most novel technology in, in the world, I think, at the moment. We have a brand new proton beam therapy center, so where conventional radiotherapy treats patients with x-rays, we now treat uh, patients with protons. And protons have this wonderful advantage is that they stop after they've reached the tumors. You can spare a lot of toxicity by irradiating less of the healthy organs around the tumor. We also have another wonderful piece of technology, which is the MR LINAC. It's an integration of a magnetic resonance imaging scanner with a radiotherapy treatment machine. And it's a wonders of engineering, really, because those two machines are kind of allergic to each other, but you know, those, those wonderful smart manufacturers made it work. And what it enables us to do is to take continuous images under treatment. So we can see how the tumor moves. We can see how the, the tumor responds. We can see how the healthy organs around the tumor can move you know, closer to the beam. So we have a lot of opportunities to again, increase the precision of treatment, give more dose to the tumor, give less dose around and decrease toxicity and improve survival in that way. Both of those pieces of technology, they're wonderful toy. And of course, as a physicist like me, I'm really interested in those aspects and ensuring the dose we give goes to the right place. This is what's kind of unique with radiotherapy is that you decide where to put the dose and you have a lot of ways to individualize the treatment to feed each individual patient. But as much as you know, I like to look at, at the tech and at the precision and at the treatment while it is delivered, another aspect that's really crucial is showing that this brings benefit to the patients in terms of their quality of life, in terms of their survival later down the line. And this is what Bilal mentioned with the Living With and Beyond Cancer. We have a brand new Living With and Beyond Cancer in Manchester as well. And things like proton beam therapy, you know, it's often used to treat children who have a very long life expectancy because we can spare them for developing a second treatment, a second cancer later in life. We can spare them from having you know, heart disease 30, 40 years after their treatment because we can be so, so much more precise in our delivery. 
So there's the physical and the tech aspect of it, but there's also all the you know public health uh, follow-up monitoring aspects of it. That's more epidemiology, and I think is also going to include a lot of data science and a lot of artificial intelligence because it's not trivial to follow those patients and to know what happens to them. 20, 30 years down the line. And we have an extraordinary setup here in Manchester with an integrated healthcare record with you know, the Christie that treats so many patients and has so many images before, during, after cancer treatment. So I think for anyone who's interested in cancer um, with the biology, but also with the more data science, public health, epidemiology aspects of it, this is a great place to be because you can have you know, you can have from the microscopic like cell or DNA level view all the way to the full life expectation of, of the person that was diagnosed with cancer decades earlier. So it's, it's really this whole integration and this full holistic vision of what does it mean to be treated with cancer and to live your life after your treatment. Fantastic. Thank you for that, Marianne. It's so it's such an exciting area. Um, we've had something coming in from the chat from our LinkedIn audience. Um, how would you feel about talking a little bit more about proton therapy? Oh, I can, I can. It's difficult to do without my graphs and with <laughs> my fancy images, but let me let me do my best. So the, the, the way we treat radiotherapy with x-ray, we have a machine that would fit, I don't know if anybody can see my office around me, but basically it fits in my room. It accelerates um, electrons and then it produces x-rays. They're very much the same x-ray that, you know, when you say I'm taking an x-ray, I'm taking an image, like you're going to the doctor and you get those 2D images of your lung taken. This is the same, this is the same kind of technology. So x-rays go through your body, they get attenuated and this attenuation process is what deposits the dose basically, but x-rays go through. With proton beam therapy, you have a heavier particle so it's going to deposit its energy. It's going to deposit those in a much more um, constrained or limited section. So you could have it deposit the dose exactly where the cancer is, but it doesn't go through. In terms of engineering, engineering, in terms of tech, if people are interested in this, the proton therapy center that we have in Manchester is over three floors. The treatment machine is on the first floor and actually the equipment you don't see goes all the way to the ground floor. So the machine is actually going over several floors and you don't see that, like the patient only sees the bit. But it's, it's in terms of, of you know, maintenance, precision and, and, and technology, it's a really, really impressive piece of kit. Um, proton therapy is not entirely new. It was developed, I think the first treatments are back to the 50s, but it has completely changed in the way of what kind of cancer can we treat with it before we could only treat like very superficial tumors on the eye or on the skin. Now we can treat any cancer in the body. We can bring all the developments in terms of computer assisted uh, treatments and planning that we have developed in conventional radiotherapy to proton therapy. So I think this is the age where really we're going to be able to demonstrate very strongly the clinical benefit of proton beam therapy and which patient it can definitely bring an advantage um, in terms of survival, in terms of decreased toxicity. As everything in oncology, it's not a magic bullet. I don't want people to leave thinking that all patients should be treated with proton beam therapy. It's a wonderful tool in a panoply of tool that we have to treat cancer with and, radiation. And, and proton, beam, proton beams prove really helpful for cer certain cancers which are yeah. difficult to get at. So cancers that Bilal doesn't want to cut out, hmm. I'm thinking in the head, where, yeah. where the trauma would cause us cause horrendous problems, actually the proton beams proving very useful. Or correct me if I'm wrong on this one, Marianne, but this is sort of one of the big areas that makes makes. Yeah, difference. no, no, ex exactly. There's there's some you know areas where you cannot operate where you have to give them quite a high dose to make sure that you kill all of the tumor cells. And things like like proton therapy help us giving that very high dose without. Uh, again, giving too much dose for the for the healthy organs around it. But some tumors are going to be better treated on an MR LINAC because they move a lot and we need you need that extra yeah. imaging capacity. So it's really finding 
the right tool for the right patient. It was the other day, I think it might well have been you actually that was talking to me about this, but it, it, I hadn't really thought about it. It was a very bit, bit silly of me. Uh, proves me I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a basic biologist and not, not, not deal with people. Um, but that, you know, how do you treat a lung cancer? Well, of course, it's moving around all the time. You can't tell the patient to stop breathing. Um, it's not very compatible. So you yeah. have to, you, you have to, yeah, it, being able to readjust the dose every time there's a breath in and out is important, isn't it? Yes, exactly. And, you know, it's it's not only the lung and the respiration, the heart beats. You have digestive processes that mean things move around. Um, and, and, you know, even when you try to immobilize patients and tell them not to move, they're breathing, living creatures who like them to be alive, right? That's why we treat them so they can stay that yeah. way. But you have, you have to handle the fact that things happen in the body also from day to day. We don't look the same. We don't breathe the same way from day to yeah. day. So that's also, you know, it's not only that the lung tumor moves, it's that it's not going to be moving the same way today and tomorrow. It might have a slightly different trajectory. And all of these, it's because of our tech and our images and all these, you know, really physics-y, I think, aspects that we can uh, we can try to, to to account for this and to design the best treatments. And, and, and then I was also, I think, again, it might, it might have been your colleague, Marcel, that was talking to me about this, um, about... Uh, once you've done first treatment round uh, with with the radiotherapy, the tumor is going to respond, and the shape and so on of the tumor will be different before you come back with your second treatment, and and then again before the third and so on and so forth. Um, and actually, that's one of the huge advantages of the MR Linac. You're not relying on the image that you took at the beginning to decide your treatment for all of the different fractions. You mm -hmm. can take an image each time, and yeah. and 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 and. And adapt the therapy as you go along, which is again something you know. It, it's when somebody points it out to you, it's blindingly obvious. But at the time, I had, I had, I had the penny hadn't dropped. And, 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 and I'm glad you, you bring up Marcel, actually, because I think that's one of the things I, I should have said, maybe my first reason for coming to Manchester was to work with wonderful experts. So Marcel is Professor Marcel Van Herk in my field in radiotherapy physics. He's a star. He's developed the technology um, that we use now every day uh, on the treatment radiotherapy machine that has been used to treat more than six million cancer patients in the world. So, you know, it's really made an impact. And I think it's the access to people like Marcel, but in all those fields, like all these expertise that we have in Manchester, you have a chance to have, um, you know, first, first well, contact I, with. I think I think that's probably a great way of also going off into was something I was going to say about about why Manchester's great um, um, is is the um, is actually that sort of umbrella organisation of the Manchester Cancer Research Centre, uh, which we are all part of one way or another. Um, it's a centre that brings together um, the university and the academic research from the university, whether that's the sort of more biology side, which is me, or the physics side, which is Marianne. Um, or, um, it also brings in the Cancer Research UK Manchester Institute, which is an absolutely fantastic uh, top end mm -hmm. research uh, department. Um, and then it brings in the hospitals. Now, of course, Christie's kind of front of that um, being the, the recognised as the cancer hospital in Manchester and it's the uh, largest single site cancer hospital in Europe if I remember rightly it's got fantastic facilities like Marianne has been talking about with the um, with the with the with the proton beam but actually we, we, we shouldn't forget that that hospital site also includes places like Salford Royal where Bill Allen is um, uh, it also includes, includes Manchester uh, University Foundation Trust and actually for the breast cancer work and breast cancer research, you would actually go through there and, and the um, Nightingale Centre, which is on the Withenshaw site. Um, it's actually bringing those, all of that together, that overarching um, organisation uh, in the Manchester Cancer Research Centre, which is led by Rob Bristow. Um, it's bringing together that research elements, whether it's biology, whether it's physics, along with those clinical services, um, that development of pathways that, that Bilal was talking about for patient treatments. It's bringing all of that together. And by bringing all that together, you've actually got the right mixture. You've got the absolute right mixture to make 
big advances and big changes. So I think that actually that's one of the real attractions, I think, for Manchester. That ecosystem is, is actually, well, second to none, I think, probably mm. globally, to be, to be fair. Um, it really is. You know, you, you've, ta- you've, you've talked quite nicely about bringing people together. It is very much a multidisciplinary uh, team yeah. approach. This is not just about experts um, in the field uh, or academics, but it's as much to do with all the tiers of um, of healthcare professional that contribute to patient care. This is about um, everybody from healthcare associates to nurses to dietitians and other health uh, allied health professionals, yep. physiotherapists. Mm-hmm. You know, a lot of the what we would call the unsung heroes of cancer care in Manchester, um, you know, quite often people are focusing on you know, professors, researchers, mm. surgeons, consultants. But actually the people who are the 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 the, the key workforce who deliver the cancer care and, and push um, the care forward, allowing others to have the brain space to perhaps do certain other things need to be celebrated as well. And I think Manchester um, can be highlighted for that. Mm. Um, This is not, again, not just about healthcare professionals or consultants or surgeons or or medical doctors, but we also have leading, world leading expertise within allied health professional uh, research as well, which we'll be bringing into the course. Uh, so this course is not just for, you know, doctors or, or, or um, scientists, but it's for anybody with an interest in, in cancer, cancer treatment along the entire pathway from very, very basic science all the way to the delivery of cancer care. And if anyone's interested in that, I, I would strongly recommend that they, uh, they register their interest. That was a fantastic plug. Thank you, Bella. <laughs> I think well, it's really important to say and, and you know, reflecting on Keith and, and just talking about the MCRC and, and the collective and the expertise that are here, what's been wonderful about putting the programme together is being able to draw on all of those expertise and feature all of that great work that's going on. Um, so we've had a mess- message from Lauren. Hi, Lauren, in the chat, who is currently a third year student nurse. She's managed to secure a job um, as a chemotherapy nurse at Christie's. Congratulations. Um, and just wanted to say thank you for the webinar. That's really, that's really nice. Um, does anybody have information on the papillon technique? So this is something that is looked at and recognised in future cancer research is a question. So um, I think maybe Marianne, are you able to give us a little bit more information on that? Yes, maybe a tiny bit. So, so the, the, the papillon technique, if I remember correctly, was, was created in France. It's, it's, it's one of these um, branches of radiotherapy that I actually use a, a radioactive source that you bring closer to the tumor. So we call it brachytherapy, so close therapy, as opposed to teletherapy when you have a beam from afar. And, and I can see where Lauren is, is, is coming from. These are, these are excellent techniques and probably underused. They're not high tech, so they tend to be a little bit forgotten maybe in a world where we, we are so focused on tech. And that's a very good point. So we do have brachytherapy research in Manchester. I'm not sure the papillon technique in, in, in particular is used, but definitely some other types of, uh, of brachytherapy. And we will bring these, these elements into the course. And, and Lauren, if you're interested in, in, in hearing more on, or, or maybe learning what is being done at the Christie, I'd be very happy to put you in touch with Professor Hoskin, for example, who's, who's done a lot of work on, on this technique, but you're, I think you're completely right. There's a lot of these of these techniques that are maybe you know highly specialist, maybe done you know in a few hands and a few center that we should not forget to to highlight and to raise um, to raise the people's awareness about this treatment as an option because they are very efficient. So actually, that's also something which we should pick up. I can pick up in sort of global sort of space. Brachytherapy is much more used in in developing countries than it is in, in say, the UK, because, as you say, it's seen as an older technique, but actually it's not expensive and it's easy to administer. So actually, um, again, this is an area where hopefully by working with our Kenyan colleagues, we will learn uh, back from them. Um, I I know they want uh, more understanding and more knowledge 
in the radiotherapy and you're talking about shorter and more concentrated doses I know will be um, of interest to them but actually I think there is a lot for us to learn uh, from what they're doing in the in the brachytherapy. Um, and actually it, it's worth pointing out that brachytherapy has also undergone a revolution so we now have yeah. image guided brachytherapy with MRI imaging before after during treatment um, so it's it's it shouldn't be thought of so much as a, as a low-tech technique, as a technique that has really blossomed and also benefited from the advanced technology that we can bring in, in other types of, yeah. uh, of radiation treatments. Fantastic. Um, so thank you for the, the questions that are coming into the chat. I'm just going to pose one more to the, to the panel. Um, so recently, the Health Secretary, Sajid Javid, announced that he would like to transform cancer care in the, in the UK to be the best in Europe. Um, he said he would aim to achieve this by both improving uh, patient care and by boosting research, particularly by investing in research into developing early cancer detection technologies. Well, this is something that we do pretty well in Manchester actually in MCRC. Um, so the question is, uh, what three early detection methods currently being researched do you think have the most potential and should be invested the most time and effort into? That's a big question. Can I, can I, can I go, go over that yeah, one? Yeah, go on, Keith. Not. <laughs> um, so I'm going to pick up uh, a friend, Gareth Evans's work, actually. Um, I think he does some very nice work in this space. It's about um, it's about breast cancer and it's, it's, it's working out risk of breast cancer and, and women that are high risk of breast cancer and therefore actually um, uh, looking at screening them much more regularly so that you can pick up the cancer at an early stage. So I don't think it's changing the technology that you pick up the cancer with, but it's actually working out which people you need to look at the most regularly. And actually there is also an implication of his work that there could be some people that are low risk who we could reduce the amount of screening on, um, which would also be a very interesting thing to do. Um, so this is looking at people's family risk, looking at their, their um, genetic makeup. So do they carry a uh, a, a BRCA mutation or another mutation that we know will cause high risk. It's looking at uh, what we call mammographic density. So that's the amount of white that you see on a mammogram. And the more white you see, the higher risk. Um, it's also looking at um, SNPs. It's looking at small changes in the DNA and recognizing that certain ones indicate higher risk as well. So there's some big mutations in very particular genes that we know about but then there's also other ones where we know that they imply to. And it's bringing all of that information together that you can start to recognize which patients you should see on a very regular basis and which patients actually we could maybe push back. So um, it's a really interesting piece of work. He's getting to the point where you can now start recognizing which groups are which. Um, but actually it goes back to the, some of this goes back to that global question there where we were talking about much earlier. Gareth's very good at doing this now in people of European descent. We need to learn how to do it in, in other descents. And actually that's um, a, a question we're gonna go and grapple with um, uh, uh, in, in the near future. But I, I think that that is certainly something I can see as being a, those risk prediction scores, whether it's done for breast or another cancer, it's a really important area. And I'd like to just uh, add some, uh, sorry, Bill, I'll just a little bit of kudos to, to Vicky Wolf, who's doing a lot of work in that area. So she's doing a PhD with Gareth and doing the qualitative um, surveys and the community engagement aspects yes. of that project, which is it, you know vitally important to be able to, to make that a success. Sorry, Bill. Al. No, I was just saying with regards to screening and early detection, uh, the, so the cancer that I treat, esophageal cancer, is uh, in the UK, uh, we have the highest incidence of uh, adenocarcinoma of the esophagus anywhere in the world. It's uh, hands down, it's the cancer which is rising at the fastest rate than any other cancer in the UK. And um, we need to be able to identify it much earlier. Um, talking on what Keith was uh, saying with regards to identifying who is more likely to develop the, this type of cancer. Um, there's a lot of work being undertaken by our colleagues down in Cambridge, uh, Rebecca Fitzgerald, looking at something called the cytosponge. The cytosponge is a 
a pill attached to a string that you swallow. The capsule of the pill dissolves within five minutes. You pull the, the, the sponge back up. Um, and on the lining of the sponge are some cells which need to be looked at. And this is uh, has been shown to be an acceptable uh, method of um, uh, screening uh, by patients and particularly for upper GI cancers, cancer of the esophagus in the stomach. Why it's so important is because, unfortunately, by the time upper GI cancers are diagnosed, the vast majority of them are metastatic or they're so advanced that they're not amenable for treatments that could potentially cure them. So it's very, very important that we try and identify upper gastrointestinal and esophageal cancers as early as possible. Um, this is now gone from the first in man stage through to now being uh, researched and looked at in clinical practice. We have several centres dotted around the northwest around Manchester, which are uh, incorporating the cytosponge and are trying to use that in, in their practice to look at uh, wider uh, acceptability. So there's lots of research going on in that. I think that's something that needs even more research and more funding. Uh, and then we also need to think about the workload that comes around through screening. We've seen that, Keith, you, you will attest to that and Marianne will know with regards to breast cancer screening, the industry that has um, developed as a result of breast cancer screening, you need more radiologists, you need more scientists, you need more pathologists, et cetera, et cetera. So how do we incorporate um, artificial intelligence, perhaps, to be able to read the, the results from the cytosponge or look at the, the cells which have been taken off the cytosponge? So again, I think that's an area that needs more funding and, and would get my vote if Sajid uh, Javid has got some loose change that he wants to throw. Fantastic. Thank you for that. Um, so just having a little prompt to say we've got about five minutes left of this webinar. So really to encourage anybody who's on the call, if you've got any questions, um, pop them in the chat and we'll, we will do our best to answer them. Um, any other reflections that, that the panel would like to sort of um, bring forward at the moment? I was wondering, Suze, if you wanted to pick up the one that's in the chat about um, help seeking behaviour in the community. Um, I was thinking, well, you do this. I'll let you talk about it. And So um, Hazel very kindly put the on cancer, uh, the link to on cancer, which is a brochure that we've released today um, that we've contributed to. And something that we're in, trying to understand a lot and to address is health inequalities. And as I kind of alluded to before, the community engagement aspect of that is really important. So engaging with community leaders enables you to have um, a, a further reach and a greater reach into those communities. And you're absolutely right, the person in the chat, you know, the help seeking behavior is something that we need to address and we need to help to educate and to support and to reassure um, you know, the, around the reasons why research is happening, why should be people should come forward for screening, why people should um, sign up for clinical trials, etc. Um, you know, it works on both sides. The scientists need to, um, you know, broaden our uh, uh, models and our cells and our tissues that we're using to study, so that we make sure that we're, you know, capturing that that diversity of the population that we're seeking to to better understand. But at the same time, we need to go into those communities and engage and gain their trust. Um, you know, there's a there's a long historical um, mistrust and a lot, lot of barriers that unfortunately tend to get passed on to by generation by generation. So it's about opening those, you know, building those relationships and building that trust and um, quite rightly um, boosting that help seeking behaviour, but also recognising symptoms and encouraging the confidence to, to, to come forward with them as early as possible. And that's, you know, that's all kind of encapsulated within that uh, the area of early detection. And, uh, and I'd, I'd like to add as well, um, whilst a large focus of my work is uh, cancer, I also treat obesity and manage obesity. And there's, of course, there's significant links between um, obesity and cancer. However, a lot of the um, treatments for obesity are perhaps um, not easily accessed by um, lower socioeconomic classes, uh, class groups or um, uh, some uh, ethnic, different ethnic backgrounds, for example, our South Asian uh, patients and communities, perhaps, who desperately 
need access to certain treatments for obesity, yet don't seem to have that access compared to Caucasians or, or, or whites in, in the UK. Uh, and there are lessons that we can learn from that. Uh, and, you know, we have to be frank about what the causes are. There's challenges at every single step of the way, including uh, discrimination amongst healthcare professionals themselves. Uh, some of that can be a subconscious bias um, towards the, the patients that are in front of them. So it's, it's a huge area, very complex and definitely needs uh, addressing. So I think, it's, I think it's actually it's an area that um, the, the Manchester Cancer Research Centre is, uh, is very keen to, to be looking into at the moment also. And it runs alongside all the research and the treatment and everything else. You know, the, the idea of social responsibility, which is one of the key goals of the University of Manchester, is that we integrate these, these thoughts and these ideas and, and, you know, really check ourselves and question our prejudice and, you know, the way we approach our, our work and integrate all of those um, into, our, into our research and also into our teaching. So there's another question, Suze, in the chat, sorry, um, that's, that's about why outcomes are, uh, are not as good amongst uh, African and Asian descent. And, and, and part of it is uh, the engagement with the, it, 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 it's, it's the distrust and the lack of engagement with the communities. And, and, and that's very much on our side as, as, the, as part of the healthcare professions. We ought to be engaging, we ought to be reaching out and working out what those what the what the difficulties are um, but also actually we touched on this at the beginning um, too many of our trials are based on on European descent and um, there are differences and we need to accept that and understand that and actually start to you know set trials up where we can get that information and they allow us to adapt the treatments and adapt the treatments um, to the person that's in front of us but not just give one blanket mm. treatment that seems to fit all. So um, it's, it's a mixture of those two, we need to learn. And too many of our trials often exclude key stakeholders, including patients. And that, that's key here as well. Yeah. Um, so yes, the ethnic diversity is really important to incorporate into our patient cohorts in research, but also the patients themselves. We, we, uh, we have a, a, a growing trend now uh, particularly from grant awarding bodies, that there must be PPI, there must be patient and public involvement. And that's something that Manchester is very strong in uh, and, and holds right at the forefront of research and trial methodology. And that's, again, something that we'll be touching upon in the course. And Marianne, I think you were going to add something also. Yeah. No, I was I was going to ask, but it, I think it's been mentioned. We've, like like you said, we, we realise that our, you know, our research and the patient population that we pool data from is often too white, too young, too male, and the needs, there is a very much recognized uh, need for diversity. So those are very, very complex questions. I'm afraid we had only two minutes to cover them. There's, there's some genetics, the social economics factor, there's lifestyle, there's, there's trust issues. We're just becoming a lot more aware of it now. And I think, I think at least in Manchester, I see a real push to, to remedy this. Um, and it, it, yeah. you know, it, it, it's important that everybody pulls up in that fight because it is a very big problem. I, I think, maybe, can, Hazel, are we allowed to plug Rob's address in, in, a, in about half an hour's time, which will address exactly this topic? <laughs> Absolutely. Please go for it. <laughs> All right. Well, then in half an hour's time, Rob Bristow will be talking about what the Manchester uh, Cancer Research Centre will be doing to try and address exactly this type of issue we it's it's writ large on the on the on the strategy for the for the for the center which i think is a, a fantastic thing for us to be doing yeah absolutely and um just looking at the time now i am afraid that that we're out of time on today's webinar um i just really want to say thank you to um all of you as the panel for taking the time um to talk to us today it's been a really really great discussion and also thank you to everyone who's joined in with their questions through the chat um as well it's been really great to get your input get your thoughts and hear your areas of interest um as well um, so for those of you who've been watching us on zoom today um i'll be in touch very soon with a copy of a recording of today's event um, so please, um, please do get in touch with me if you've got any further questions um, that you have about the course, um, and um, I'll be more than happy to help. Um, 
for anyone who's joining us um, from LinkedIn as well, I'm going to put my contact details on the screen as well for you to be able to um, get in touch too, if you do want to um, get in touch and ask any further questions. Um, it's been really, really great to be joined by all of you today. Um, and like I said, thank you so much. It's been a really, really interesting discussion and we've covered so many different viewpoints um, and different perspectives as well. Um, we really have had an audience from all across the world. Um, we've had people from um, Manchester, Egypt, Nairobi, um, Indonesia, um, just to name a few. There's far too many countries for me to go through and make a list of as you were all putting your countries in the chat um, to us earlier. Um, so really that wraps up today's webinar and just to reiterate, thank you so much for taking the time today to join us, um, both our panel and all of our audience, and we really do hope to hear from you um, again very soon as well. And Joe has also just put in the um, chat um, here on Zoom a link to um, join the address that Keith has just mentioned um, as well. So um, please do join if you want to hear any more information today. Thanks everybody. I hope to see some of you on the course in September. Take care now. Thank you panel also. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.